The opposition National Democratic Congress has distanced itself from comments by its member of parliament for Dodo Dodo that it will free the recently jailed former National Youth Employment Programs coordinator, Abuga Pele, when the party regains power the next general election. Ilante Van der Poy has courted controversy for claiming the NDC will free the former MP who was sentenced last week to a six-year jail term for causing financial loss to the state in the infamous Jada scandal. Businessman Philip Asibit was also sentenced to 12 years behind bars. Though a member of NDC, a number of N NDC MPs have expressed their comments, Nilante Van der Poy's comments appear not to have gone down well with the party's National Executive Committee, which issued a statement in the last few hours. Before we bring you their statement, let's hear what the Ududududu MP said. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I can only say that um uh, 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 Buka Pele has always been a friend of mine, a colleague. He was my senior at the university, and we played football together. Um, it's unfortunate, but I can only say that this will not dampen the spirit of the NDC. In 2000, between 2001 and 2004, they, sens they sentenced Chachuchikata, Dabodapi, Ibrahim Madam, and Kwame Pipra. It did not stop us from winning elections in 2008. We are going to win the elections and bring Abuka Pele out. Now, the National Executive Committee of the NDC, which Neil Antivanapoy belongs, has branded his comments as absurd and unfortunate. General Secretary John Singh Esiedu Nketia, who signed the statement, told Joy News on Top Story, since the NDC was the initiator of the conviction, it cannot turn around to pardon any person who has been convicted as a result. Look at the background to his conviction. You realize that it will be absurd for anybody to suggest that another NDC government will come and free him because he was not prosecuted by an NDC government. He was prosecuted by an NDC government. The investigation that led to his prosecution was conducted by an NDC government. So it just happened that conviction has happened when MPP is in power. MPP doesn't have any hand in convicting Honorable Abu Gapile. It is indeed from we ourselves. And our belief in uh, fighting uh, waste and, and corruption, it is only the court that decides whether somebody has done wrong or hasn't done wrong. When there is an allegation, if a member of our party finds himself in, in, in jail, emotionally, I mean, we are all at, at stake. We will feel it. But this is the wrong time to seek to subject the state interest national interest to individual, uh, personal, and political interest. I don't think that, you know, wrongdoing uh, has political quality. If we did that, we cannot make any progress in our fight against the uh, I mean, if you listen to your member of parliament for the Dodo, he mentioned some examples to back his conclusion that the, uh, um, the party will take that step to release him. He mentions Dana Budaku, he mentions Chachuchigata, and he believes these are individuals who have if jailed under an MPP. Jailed under MPP administration, not NDC administration. And we initiated the prosecution, we initiated the investigation in the case of Abu Gatele. So it doesn't sit well when you say that the person we have investigated and prosecuted, if he gets convicted, and it happens that at the time of the conviction we are in opposition, we will now come back to power and go and release him. If, we, if that is the case, why would we prosecute him in the first place? We fought the case of uh, the case involving uh, Honorable Abu Dhabi and the others believe that they were not given fair hearing. And there are cases where they wanted to even bring witnesses. In the case of Chatsuchi Kata, they wanted to bring in witnesses, critical witnesses who can testify. And it was prevented by the government at that time from so doing. So it means that they have not gotten fair trial. And that is the basis of which we were agitated. Now, the Ghana Police Service says personnel found culpable of committing any crime while on a UN peacekeeping mission will face court action, while those found to have misconducted themselves would appear before a police inquiry committee. The personnel from Ghana's formed police unit have been accused of engaging in sexual activity with men, women living at United Nations protected sites. The personnel have been recalled from the community and confined to bays following the allegations. Speaking on news desk earlier, following an allegation of sexual exploitation by members of the formed unit uh, were in South Sudan. Director of Public Affairs, ACP David Aklu, emphasized the personnel on peacekeeping are supposed to have zero tolerance for sexual activities with or without consent. There are two levels of punishment. The UN itself has its own punishments after the, after the 
the MOU. Internally, there are also these smart actions that can be taken against the officers involved. If it is a crime mm. that the law says can be punished anywhere, they will face court action. But if it is not a crime but a misconduct, then there are also rules and regulations for taking them through internal service inquiry discipline, mm -hmm. uh, disciplinary procedures. Yeah. ACP, what is the proper behavior or code of ethics for personnel who are deployed to such missions with regards to their sexual relations? Yes, before you are deployed for UN peacekeeping missions, you are taken through pre-deployment training which is done here internationally. And then when you get to the mission ground, you're also taken through another level of training. One, you have to respect the customs and traditions of the host people of the host country. You have to treat them with courtesy. And you must avoid any sexual relations with the locals. Mm. Whether it is by consent or not, it is a no-go area for peacekeepers. We would uh, wait for the investigations. We are also sending a team there to have a full understanding of the situation mm. and see what can be done to correct it immediately. Right, so what does the UN itself say about people who engage in misconduct or in fact sexual, what it describes as sexual exploitation? Let's look at that because the debate has been whether the armed forces or the police officers who were out there who go on peacekeeping duties can have uh, sexual relations of any sort. Now the UN spells it out clearly on its website and we're going to that. Um, it says prohibition of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. It says sexual exploitation and sexual abuse violate, violate universally recognized international legal norms and standards and have always been unacceptable behavior and prohibited conduct for United Nations staff. Such conduct is prohibited by the United Nations staff regulations and rules. 3.2 says in order to further protect the most vulnerable populations, especially women and children, the following specific standards which reiterate existing general obligations under the United Nations staff regulations and rules are promulgated. A. Sexual exploitation and sexual abuse constitute acts of serious misconduct and are therefore grounds for disciplinary measures, including summary dismissal. Sexual activity with children, persons under the age of 18, is prohibited uh, regardless of the age of majority of, 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 or age of consent locally. Mistaking belief in the age of a child is not a defense. Exchange of money employment, goods or services for sex, including sexual favors or other forms of humiliating, degrading or exploitative behavior is prohibited. This includes any exchange of assistance that is due to beneficiaries of assistance. Sexual relationships between United Nations staff and beneficiaries of assistance, since they are based on inherently unequal power dynamics, undermine the credibility and integrity of the work of the United Nations and are strongly discouraged. Where a United Nations staff member develops concerns or suspicions regarding sexual exploitation or sexual abuse by a fellow worker, whether in the same agency or not, and whether or not within the United Nations system, he or she must report uh, such concerns by established uh, reporting mechanism. Now, the statement actually goes on all the regulations that uh, you find out here uh, actually go on to talk specifically about officers or people on peacekeeping duties or peacekeeping operations and it spells it out clearly and uh, it's uh, under these uh, regulations that the form police units is being cited for misconduct. Now you're watching uh, Joy News Prime. We're taking a break at this point, but still ahead in the bulletin, Vice President, the Vice President asked the Auditor General to join forces with the Special Prosecutor to fight political corruption, reiterating government's commitment to fight the canker. believe that the Auditor General and the Special Prosecutor will work closely in ensuring a sound and effective public financial management in the country. Stay tuned, we'll be back in a bit.
Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia has charged the Auditor General to team up with the Special Prosecutor, Martin Amidou, to fight political corruption. Describing corruption as a nation wrecker, he assured government will fight it without fear or favor. He was speaking at the 2018 Accountability Week celebration held in Accra, where the Auditor General also announced that all public servants with a salary of more than 3,727 CDs are required to declare their assets like all government appointees. FY Evans Chinri reports. Vice President Dr. Mohamed Balmia commended the Auditor General for disallowing some 5.4 billion CDs in claims made on government that would have otherwise been drained from state coffers, adding that those found culpable would be prosecuted. You found 5.4 billion from the recent audit, but how much was actually paid in the past that we don't know about for some of these ghost claims? It's a serious problem. I urge the Auditor General to sustain this exercise in order to instill discipline in public financial management at all levels of government and to deter public officers who might be contemplating to dupe the state using their unpatriotic practices. It is my expectation and I believe that the Auditor General and the Special Prosecutor will work closely in ensuring a sound and effective public financial management in the country. The Auditor General, Daniel Domelevo, who spoke before the Vice President made his remarks, explained that the requirement for all public servants to declare their salaries once they earn above a certain threshold is to ensure they do not amass ill-gotten wealth and advise all of them to check their pay slips and comply accordingly. Politicians are required to declare their assets and liabilities, but public office holders are also required to do same. Any officer in any public office or public institution other than the armed forces whose salary is equal to or higher than that of the salary of a director in the civil service is required but at, at 550 to declare his or her liabilities and assets. Any public servant whose salary is more than 3,727 per month. So check your pay slips. <laughs> whose salary is more than 3,727 or above is required to declare assets and liabilities. He revealed that Parliament is yet to furnish his office with its financial statements for auditing. The Auditor General reminded his officers to refrain from demanding or accepting bribes in the performance of their duties, warning that those who fail to report infractions or irregularities will be sanctioned as stated by law. He said a system will soon be established to encourage the general public to lodge complaints on suspected cases of mismanagement, fraud and other irregularities in the public service. No, the Center for Democratic Development says simply compelling people to declare their assets is a weak anti-corruption strategy. Senior Programs Manager Kwabna Mensa Wabrampa says there is a pressing need to publicize and monitor progress of public officials during their tenure vis-a-vis assets they declare. His views are shared by Executive Director of Pen Plus Bytes, Kwame Ahiabenu, who adds liabilities of public officers also ought to be declared. They both spoke earlier on the polls with Gifty and up here. It's good for you to declare your assets. But, if but you to don't, what end? Yes. So <laughs> we need to go beyond that and look at how we can ensure that that declaration is done in a manner that we can have access to the information mm -hmm. when there's change in people's income and also liabilities because you can go into public office with liabilities. Mm -hmm. And if you pay off the liabilities, it's equally good as any... Because it won't yes. be recorded no, in, your, yeah. in, so in your assets. Yeah, yeah, you have to present all your <laughs> liabilities and assets. Mm -hmm. And once there's change, now we can hold you to account. That sounds interesting to me, Mr. Rampa. What do you say? Well, there's only exactly that because the, the end point so far knowing people who enter into politics of government uh, assets is to try to monitor how they progress in their lifetime in the office. Mm. Uh, so if the asset is so held in secrecy, mm. how do we then hold that accountability in their lifetime? Uh, like what Buhari did, even the cows that he owes were made public uh, for everybody to know. <laughs> So if the cows are at 10 in the lifetime of Buhari, everybody will know. So it's not enough to conceal the asset and give it to the Auditor General. It's enough for us to know what is in the assets. Mm. How in the four years are you able to build upon the assets or reduce it? 
And now the trial of 10 of the suspects involved in the attack on the Kwabenya police station have been sent, has been set for March 9. The 10, including the masterminds and accomplices, attacked the police station to free their colleagues who were in custody at the time, killing the officer on duty, Inspector Ashilevi. And Accra Circuit Court had on Monday denied their bail request. Here's Jacqueline Johnson Quay's report. The 10 include Nancy Dante, a bread seller who was said to have smuggled a hacksaw blade and a knife to be used to saw off the padlock to the cell. Another eight of the suspects, according to the police, were either involved in the shootout at the police station or assisted the operation in other ways. Kofi Dako. It was necessary that he refuse bail and instead facilitate the trial of the accused persons. He also sent a warning to the prosecution to ensure that they are prepared for the trial, which is set for between March 9. Counsel for the fourth accused, Bernard Uredu, expressed disquiet over the judge's refusal to grant his client, Nancy Dante, bail. I'm not happy. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed because I thought that uh, I'm a lawyer for the accused person and I, I, I hold the view that her situation was such that um, the court should have been favorable to her by uh, granting her bill uh, because um, she demonstrated that if granted bill she would definitely come appear before the court for trial to start. But as, as we have it, bill is a discretionary. I mean, it's, it's a decision for the judge to a take. So he says um, in his view that it is unlikely uh, they will come to stand trial when they are called upon. That is his view but um, I'm here to take further instructions from my clients and I'm sure maybe uh, I'm not probably predicting what my client might say but I'm sure we might go to high court, the high court. The police are still looking for four of the escapees as well as a few more accomplices. Jacqueline Johnson Quays reports for Joy News. The rainy season for residents living around the Odor drain here in Accra only evokes memories of the June 3 flood and fire disasters which claimed many lives two years ago. For them, any storm warning, such as the one released by the Ghana Meteorological Agency Monday dawn, sets them on edge, unsure of its implications for their lives and property. Joy News' Maxwell Agbagwa interacted with some of them living near the Kwame Nkrumah interchange as the clouds formed on Monday. Experts say it was a black Wednesday that wasn't supposed to be. They contend that the other drain was choked with plastics and other materials. They argue that the continuous dredging of this drain would have averted the disaster. On that fateful day, this drain overflowed eight banks. That resulted in the flooding of this community and the subsequent explosion. So on that fateful Wednesday, I came here early and then service starts at 7 to 8. So after service, we were here chit-chatting and it started raining during the service. So we wanted the rain to subside before we leave. But unfortunately, the rain didn't subside and the pool place got flooded and then we were all caught up here. Water was almost at this side of my, le this level of my body, yes. So let's take today for instance, I left the house coming when it started raining. So all that came into my mind, hey Abna, you are going to cycle again and it has started raining. So it put some sort of fear in, in me personally. For residents who live here in this community and for those who come here to do business, that deadly episode continues to play in their minds. One of them is Stanis Loy. He has been doing business here for uh, many years now, but he tells me anytime the clouds gather, he has to close because he fears this place will get flooded again. Stanis, how are you doing? Great. The, the, the rain block the overpass, the block everywhere. So we climb the new overhead to watch what is going on. And you see the fire and the water are battling together. Blue. The fire is blue, passing through the water like everywhere. After the rain, if you pass Kuba land and cheese, you see dead person on the road, like how they spread maize. How they spread maize. I'm telling you, plenty. Well, since up to now, that fear catch us. Anytime you see the rain coming more and more, then your heart 
hey, this thing is going to happen again? The woman who died used to live here with her sister. She is called Sister Mary. They are from Suhum. When it started raining, we sought refuge at the story building. After the floods, some people from the market came to look for her. That was when we realized she died in the floods. Last Tuesday, it rained. It rained the following week, too. I was really scared. The other time, I was going to sell oranges, but I couldn't go because it was about to rain. Although we have dredged the outdoor drain, any time it's about to rain, we become afraid. After the disaster, city authorities said never again will Accra or any parts of Ghana experience that deadly disaster. But as the rain sets in, it remains to be seen whether that will be the case. Reporting for Joy News, Maxwell Agbagba. Okay. We're taking a break here on Joy News Prime, but still ahead in business with only three more days for the rollout of the tax stamp policy. Joy Business checks indicate many local manufacturing firms are far from ready with their stamp fixing machines. We have that coming up in a bit station. Hello again, good evening to you. Time now for business. Now, with only three days to the rollout, the much talked about tax stamp policy, joy business checks at some local manufacturing firms show the stamps are not being affixed onto the products. It is obvious that local manufacturers and manufacturing firms are not ready with installation of affixing machines. Charles IT has been to the Coca-Cola bottling company to ascertain its readiness to meet the deadline. Here at the warehouse of the Coca-Cola bottling company, you can see tens of cartons of bottled you know, uh, products here. Now, all these cartons do not have the tax stamps on them as being you know, ordered by government. We shall be finding out the main reasons why, especially as the 1st of March deadline for the rollout of the tax stamp policy is underway. During our visit to the factory and warehouse of Coca-Cola bottling company, the observation was that the multinational company lacked an affixing machine as requested by the new tax stamp policy. Head of Corporate Affairs at the Coca-Cola bottling plant at Spintex in Accra, Bethel Yeboah tells Joy Business his outfit is still engaging government for a possible reconsideration of the tax stamp policy. Currently, as you know, I'm talking to you now, we have not you know, acquired the, the affixing machine. And so you would definitely not see you know, uh, a tax stamp on our products. So far, government has contracted a USA-based firm, Authentix, to help roll out the tax stamp system, ostensibly to monitor the production and importation of bottled beverages and water. According to Beth Yabois, all efforts by the US-based company to sign an agreement with Coca-Cola has proved futile. As far as Authentix is concerned, um, the engagement in, uh, uh, in the past up until now has been, you know, um, how do you get, you know, the affixing machine in terms of uh, like the cost and stuff like that. Those are the engagements that we've had with Authentix. The Coca-Cola bottling company is one of the largest local manufacturing companies in Ghana, producing close to about 100,000 cartons of bottled soft drinks a day for the wholesale and retail market. Several other local manufacturing firms would now have to find ways of investing over 800,000 US dollars for the installation of the affixing machines. Typically, if we were to see a tax stamp on this product, where would we have seen it? Which, which part of the bottle? Okay, currently, according to the policy, it's supposed to be affixed in a manner that would be visible to the average consumer who goes to purchase at a, a, a shop outlet. Okay, so it would have to be affixed you know, on top you know, of the closure, as, as my hands indicate over here. Okay. So far, checks by Joy Business show that no beverage manufacturer, including Guinness Ghana Brewery Limited, Casaprico Company Limited, Accra Brewery Limited, Pepsi Ghana Limited, and Coca-Cola Bottling Company Limited, had procured or installed the tax stamp affixing machine needed for the smooth enforcement of the policy. For Joy Business, Charles Aita reporting. Final. <clears throat> Finance Minister Ken Ufuriata says the economy is now poised for the expected transformation and growth 
at a family stabilizing last year. He was at an engagement with business and financial journalists on the state of the economy and progress. There's more in this report. The meeting was meant to give journalists an update on the 2018 fiscal developments, expenditure and update on disbursement of major policy initiatives. Some of the main issues the minister touched on also included some policies being implemented to help transform the economy. According to the ministry, this transformation will be influenced by government's commitment to move Ghana beyond aid. The key thing for us uh, in this office is, is sustainability, um, whether we have um, the resources um, to pay for it. And when you see the, the explanation given uh, on the primary balance, uh, it doesn't really matter irrespective of what it is. Uh, you can see efforts um, towards um, uh, moving the matrix such that um, we really uh, are trying hard um, not to borrow, to support borrowing. And I think that that's an important story uh, in and of itself. Um, I suspect even the rebasing uh, is going to even give us uh, a bigger and give us technically more capacity to borrow more. Uh, but what is really critical is is the payments relative to revenue. Uh, so then we come back to you know, how much we can get our revenue uh, bolstered. The minister also spoke about how far they have come in reducing the public debt. Going forward, we'll be focusing on expanding um, the economy and creating more uh, opportunities um, for, for all of us um, Ghanaians um, to be able to, 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 to operate. Um, and, and in a sense, um, we met um, sort of our key macroeconomic targets uh, in 2017 uh, and successfully uh, completed the IMF um, fourth, uh, fourth review uh, program. Um, uh, we have performed um, the deficit target of 6.3% um, to 6% from 9%. Uh, we reduce the total debt to GDP ratios to under 70%. Uh, we exceeded the annual real GDP growth target um, of 6.3%. Now, President Akufuado has been seeking the support of American businesses to invest in developing the country's infrastructure. Addressing 50 U.S. governors in Washington, D.C., the president noted that the current infrastructure deficit was a big challenge for the economy. He said his government was ready to partner the private sector to meet this deficit. The key challenge of our economy, like many other economies in Africa, is our infrastructural deficit. We're embarking on an aggressive public-private partnership program to attract to attract investment in the development of both our road and railway infrastructure. We are hopeful that with solid private sector participation, we can develop a modern railway network with strong production center linkages and with the potential to connect us to our neighbors to the north, i.e. Burkina Faso, the west, i.e. Côte d'Ivoire, and to the east, i.e. Togo. Apart from prosecuting the agenda of building with the private sector at least one factory in each district in, of Ghana, the time has come for Ghana to develop strategic industries out of its abundant natural resources of bauxite and iron ore. We shall shortly establish an integrated bauxite aluminum development authority to assemble the relevant financial resources with the systematic exploitation and development of our bauxite deposits. By the same token, we've decided to exploit our substantial iron ore and manganese deposits situated in the western and northern regions of our country to build an integrated steel industry to serve the needs of our country and region. We're making systematic efforts to develop our new oil and gas industry into which ExxonMobil has just appeared, signing on 18th January of this year a major offshore oil and gas exploration and production agreement with Ghana. We're determined also to establish the relevant petrochemical industry to take advantage of the growth of our oil and gas industry. 
there is a lot of opportunity for American capital, technology, and enterprise in Ghana and indeed in Africa. And we welcome companies from all your states to participate in the exceptional opportunities that exist in our country and on the continent. That's all we have for you by way of business tonight. Thank you so much for watching this morning's ahead. Good evening. Now, you're welcome back to join News Prime. Staying with some more business, Finance Minister Ken Ofriata on Monday painted a rosy image of the state of the economy and challenged those who sometimes complain about not feeling the positive impact in their pockets to show evidence that they have fully fulfilled their tax obligations. The issue of the state of the economy has been topical since the MPP took, the MPP government took over power. While the position in DC maintains Ghana is under poor management, the governing MPP has been of the view all indicators are pointing in the right direction. The finance minister, who was addressing a news conference on Monday, described as remarkable the performance of the economy in the last two years the MPP has been in power. In the end, it's, it's, it's a real question, um, um, gentlemen and ladies here, of why are we in this situation? And when you look at uh, VAT, penetration rate of 11 percent, which should be about, you know, 22 or 25. Um, obviously, we the citizens uh, are not paying. Uh, when individuals like you and I are not paying our personal income taxes, um, that is also a reality. Um, I think some showed um, some peer comparisons of um, Ghana's revenue to GDP being 15 percent. Um, as opposed to 20-25%. That's an awful lot of resources. Um, that is a leakage. Um, so at what point do we also honestly face ourselves as a country and everybody begin um, to contribute their part of that, you know? So if that nice suited gentleman asks you, uh, well, I'm not feeling in my pocket, you know, ask whether that person has even ever filed his income tax before. Yeah, and it's a very relevant question for a society um, that is growing, uh, that wants to go beyond aid, um, that everybody fulfills um, their part of the responsibility that we have. 245 sites have been identified for government's flagship program One Village, One Dam in the northern region. The Ghana Social Opportunities Project, GSOP, was tasked to identify 125 of which 120 have been identified, whilst a private consultant has been also been identi has also identified 125. Martina Bugri's report. In all, 250 sites are expected to be identified for the building of the dams to take off. The engineer at the Ghana Irrigation Development Authority, Swahilu Jalilu Ajaska, said except for the North Gunja district, which is yet to be surveyed, all the districts are set for the award of contract for the construction of the dams. Previously, most of these dugouts were constructed without any engineering element. You can see it's virtually just a long wall without any um, design parameters. But we are doing detailed design considering the topographical elements and heights such that the location of the structure is ideal and the storage capacities are reasonable and the discharge, that is the spring water that needs to be exit, is done. Given us the I mean, required storage we needed for these structures. And we have done this in line with the conservative water needs of all parameters regarding uh, uh, the structure. Total water losses, seepage considerations, and what have you. So sustainability is something that is guaranteed before the contractors will hit the ground. Mr. Ajaska said the dams would be sustained because of the technical expertise being employed. He said in the past, most of the dams were constructed without technical advice, hence their failure to meet the needs of the people in the dry season. We've identified a total number of uh, 260 
some size within the northern region. Um, we have 10 uh, districts within the northern region. So far, that's what we have identified, and work has been carried out on all these sites. Uh, we have done community studies a long time ago. Currently, we have finished with civil work. What is trending now is get the designs and then uh, possible awards constructed. Then except one district which will be uh, happening next week, that is the Gaboya district. At Bole, the district chief executive, Alele Veronica Hemming, said the 10 dams for her district when constructed would boost economic growth of the area. When these 10 dams are all completed, it will give us a lot of impact. It is very good. And the way they have chosen the places, the places they've chosen, they are just strategic places, places that people are really suffering to get water. That's where they have gotten our one village wonder. Martina Bugri's report from the northern region. Now, some men are not allowing their wives to take up contraceptives as they believe that may lead to lead them to cheat or go into prostitution. The belief fueled by culture has stalled coverage of family planning services to some parts of the country. In the following report, my colleague Justice Bader report from the northern region town of Lipalsi on how this is driving up birth rates in an already impoverished community. I am in the home of Neloba. She's only in her mid-twenties, but already has her third baby. Her children heavily malnourished. Her husband, Jagri Tali, has a first wife with whom he already has ten children. Their story shows escalating birth rates in some communities in Ghana and how these vulnerable villages are struggling to cope. In our culture, when a woman delivers, you have to have sex with her within three months, he says, and it's a taboo to allow a woman to take up family planning. <laughs> At the local clinic in Lake Palsy, health workers are talking community members into taking up contraceptives. The stumbling block here is cultural beliefs. We, the men, would not allow our wives to take up these contraceptives. If they do, they will start sleeping around. Some of the men, they don't allow their wives to do the farmer plan. Because of that, some of them, they usually hide and come in the night and wake you up so that you attend to them. A woman can give birth two months or three months, the woman will be pregnant again. The child, the child is not growing well, she herself is not feeling well. So because of that, you yourself you become frustrated. Birth rates have fallen generally across Ghana, in part because of increased access to family planning services. Interestingly, in places like Leposi, where resources to cater for population explosion are limited, the figures haven't been encouraging. With local economies still unable to provide basic amenities for already existing numbers, any further growth may only worsen the situation. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Le Palsy. Yes, and Twa Girls Senior High School is battling with what authorities say is incessant knockdowns of students and teachers by vehicles on the Kumasi Sunyani Road, which straddles the school. In one such life threatening incident, the victim, a student, is said to have stayed out of school for almost a year, thereby retarding her academic uh, work for the period. Though there's been no fatality yet, the students want a footbridge across the highway from the main gate so they, they and the teachers will not have to cross the road. School prefect D. Bless also made the request at the 58th anniversary speech and prize giving day in Kumasi. Love Affirms Kwesi Deborah reports.
The Tenosubwaka stretch of the highway is noted for its perennial heavy vehicular congestion. Impatient and lawless motorists have the tendency of overtaking wrongly, mostly using the shoulder of the road. This has always resulted in accidents with attendant casualties. Yasantua SHS with high day student population wants government to intervene. They are scared plans to develop the road into a dual carriage will worsen the situation. Ms. Tibles Wusu echoes the sentiments of her colleagues as well as teachers. I will plead with you to do everything possible within your capacity to help construct a footbridge in the front of our school gates for the students and especially the day students. We ask for this because some of our students and teachers have been knocked down by vehicles in their attempt to cross the road. I will again appeal to the authorities to supply the school with a bus to transport the day students and teachers who live in town to school. This school has her mistress is Swande Ishan Famir appealed for renovation of deteriorating school structures among other concerns. Our administration block and other physical structures like the dormitories and classrooms are getting weaker by the day and needs major renovations. And so we are appealing to you to come to our aid and renovate them for us. Nana Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in today's digital world, the e-library is very useful in teaching and learning and research. And so we are equally pleading with you to come and help us talk our e-libraries with com our e-library with computers. Ashanti Regional Deputy Minister Elizabeth Ajeman emphasized science and home economics education to reduce domestic accidents. Child Rights International, an advocacy group, has sent representatives to Kumasi to ascertain and support victims of sexual abuse at the Yusuman Senior High School. This follows reports from girls who spoke to Love News on how some teachers make them grope their sexual organs, having hauled before the school's disciplinary committee. Executive Secretary of Child Rights International, Bright Apia, said those girls ought to be commended for their, their bravery and also be protected. I think that uh, when I heard it, uh, what I said was that these, these girls are very bold, uh, looking at the, where they are mm. and the things that happen to them on a daily basis. For them to be bold enough to step out and say that this is what is happening to them, I think mm. that it is a bold step. Because there are instances where you see children go through those things, but yeah. they find it very difficult to, to, speak. to, to, to speak out mm. on it because of the victimization and all that. So if they've bro broken all the barriers uh, to speak to the issues, I think that it's a very fine step that we have to base on. But whatever mm. it is, I think that we have to fight for these uh, children. But for somebody who is going to abuse, to, to come out and say that is what is happening. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, we need to also ensure that we give them the supporting uh, system. We put the supporting systems in place. So and that and we that's deal with where I worry. That's we have taken the, the step to go to the aid of these girl dadas master the courage to do that mm. and then ensure that we protect them. They go to their school environment safely and nothing happens to them. And anybody who wants to take action against them, we would also uh, uh, sort to the appropriate forum to seek for the interests of these children. Because mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, I have had an encounter with children who have complained to me. But when you ask them to take it further, they find it very difficult to do that. But for them to do this, I think that we have to look for them and then see how we can also support them because this will be the beginning of unveiling most of the things that happen to children in this mm, school. And you did mention... The Child Rights Group, which is outraged at the slow pace of response from the Ghana Education Service and the Ministry of Education on the matter, says we will soon launch a WhatsApp line through which students can share their WhatsApp conversations with teachers demanding sexual favours. And that's it for the bulletin. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.